Welcome back to PCTV Reports. It's been about six months since Operation Rio Grande started here in the Salt Lake Valley, so I came to the Utah Capitol to talk to some of the key players on the legislative side to discuss some of the hardships and successes that they've seen so far throughout the program. Let's head inside and take a look. Over the past few years, uh, things had, had just gotten so bad in that area, down in the Rio Grande area. The uh, the drug trafficking had had grown to an extent that we we'd really never seen in anywhere in our state and and maybe our country. Just just incredible the, the open air drug market that had, had transpired down there, and the human suffering and people that needed services were afraid to go down there, and uh, it, it just it just got out of hand. We had we had some uh, homicides happening in early July. And and it came to the point where we just felt like we needed to come together and do something. And so it's, it's a huge collaboration between Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County, and the state of Utah. And, and we just all came together and said, this is a problem for everyone. This is our capital city. It impacts, uh, it impacts the state, even though it's a, a small geographic area. And, uh, and we're all in this together. And so what we came up with was really a three-phase plan. Uh, phase one was law enforcement. We had to restore order in that area. We had to, uh, we had to remove the drug trafficking that was happening down there. Uh, phase two was really to, to, to separate the, the, the homeless population from the population that was had addiction problems and uh, those that needed mental health services. And again, there's, there's a combination of those. A lot of those, those folks are homeless as well for obvious reasons and get them the treatment that they needed. So phase two is really focused on treatment, getting additional treatment beds, getting additional funding. We were able to do that through some Medicaid expansion and uh, get more and more people the help that they needed to get back on their feet. And, and then we launched a, a little while later into phase three, which we call the dignity of work. And that is helping people who, who are out of a job, who are, have gotten treatment and are trying to get their lives back together, help them find ways to get back into the job market, to be able to get stable employment so that they can find housing and, and really become participating members of, uh, of our economy and of society. I mean, you, you put some Someone in jail and someone who has mental health uh, issues or has a drug addiction and you can put them in jail for as long as you want when they get out they still have mental health problems and, and, and usually still have drug addiction or fall back into their 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 old lifestyle and so that's not helping it's not working we can't afford to just keep putting people in jail and and it's it's also just the wrong thing to do individuals don't don't want to be addicted to drugs individuals don't want to be living on the street and with opioids and and the opioid crisis that we're seeing those numbers are just skyrocketing you shouldn't be a knee surgery away from being homeless and and addicted on the street and so we have to change the way we look at this we have to start looking at the one the individual helping them one at a time and, and getting them back into society. It, it happens to be the fiscally conservative thing to do because it actually saves money over time getting people treatment, but it also happens to be the, the human thing to do, the right thing to do to help people. Yeah, well, it is a collaborative effort, unlike anything we've probably seen in our state's history, which is amazing. It's, it's not just Republicans or it's not just Democrats, it's everybody coming together. And individuals can play a huge role in this. And, and the way they can do that is they can donate and we encourage those donations. Uh, find a, a, a service provider, find a charitable organization that participates in, in, in homeless services and, uh, and donate. They, they desperately need it. And then also volunteer. Look for ways to serve. Um, come and, and serve at, at your, your local soup kitchen. Come and uh, see if you can volunteer at the road home. Look for those volunteer opportunities. It will change your life. So from a legislative standpoint, it really is mostly about funding. Um, that's the big thing. Again, historically, homelessness and services and things were left to the city and the, and the county. Now the state is taking a much bigger role in, in this. And so the, the numbers we're talking about are really big numbers. You know, we're talking um, the, the, the budget for this thing is, is, is pushing $70 million. So it's a really big number now. Not all of that is coming from the state. And a lot of this is coming from spending that we were already doing, just repurposing it in a way that makes sense. But there are additional numbers. And 
the good news is our private partners have stepped up. Uh, Gail Miller, $10 million. Uh, the LDS Church has stepped up with a big donation. The Catholic Church has stepped up with their services. And so the, the private sector is coming together with city, county, and state. So we're all picking up pieces. The, the, the last piece that we're working on right now, this session, is for those cities that do not have a, a shelter or do not have a resource center, they need to start participating too. This isn't just a Salt Lake City issue. Because if you're homeless and you live in Sandy, um, you're going to come to Salt Lake City. So Sandy City has a role to play in this as well. So we're working with the legislature on that funding piece and we feel pretty confident that we'll be able to get that done. The successes will be one, getting the funding in place, two, getting the new resource centers open, uh, three, looking at lowering the average stay of people in the homeless shelter, so trying to stop it from from coming in in the first place. And then, and then fourth, it's, it's the individual stories. It's, it's how many of these people get jobs, how many of them get into housing. And uh, one at a time, we're, we're making a big difference there and, and we'll continue, continue to monitor that. The good news is that it was mostly good news. As, as we were able to evaluate what has happened, we have more people in treatment than ever before. Uh, we have more people getting jobs than ever before. And uh, we, we actually have people getting the, the services they need. Uh, the drug dealing is not happening nearly to the extent that it was before. And, uh, and people who, were, who needed help but were afraid to go down there have come back. Back. They feel safe there for, for the first time in years. And, uh, and, and, and so that's how we're seeing success. And we've got some metrics out there. We're, we're hoping to, uh, to lower the, the, the night stays, the, the amount of nights that the average person is staying at the homeless shelter, um, because that means we're getting them help, we're finding them housing, we're getting them back on their feet. Uh, the, we also realize we still have a lot of work to do. Um, our, our numbers are still high. A lot of cities are, are struggling with this. Uh, California is really struggling, Chicago, uh, just different cities across, across the country. Um, but we're, we're preparing in 2019 to build, well, we're starting building now, but we'll be closing the road home. We'll have three new resource centers coming up in 2019. We're going to change the way we deliver those services. And, and so the, the next phase of this is really transitioning from what we have now, warehousing in a big homeless shelter, to the more nimble, getting people the services they need, getting them treatment, and getting them back on their feet. So the best place is the website. There are statistics in every phase. I talked about the three phases. You can look at those three phases. It's interactive. We're updating those uh, every month, and you can see the progress being made in real time. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Be sure and stay tuned over the course of the next couple weeks because I'll be talking to more people from different facets of the Operation Rio Grande program to hear what they have to say. That's not all for PCTV Reports. Stay tuned. We have much more coming up right after this break.